I'm live with you now, Sean. So let me give you a brief introduction. All right. We went over how to say your last name. So Sean Pastuch of Active Life is on with us. I've known Sean, it's probably going on 10 years now. He worked on me before Active Life was the big uh, corporation that it is today. <laughs> and, and so it's a privilege to have you on. I love your stuff. I love what you're doing. You know, I check you guys out regularly. I do my best to incorporate it. And you're, you're, how would I say, you're, you're impacting the fitness world, which is great. Thanks. And you also take a lot of selfies on the toilet, which I like about you. Only, only for private friends and <laughs> once in a while for attention on Instagram. Yeah. And Instagram, I was going to say, <laughs> you, you, I think there's probably a bunch of those pictures that your shirt doesn't cover everything on your phone. Yeah, you're probably right about that. <laughs> <laughs> but those don't make it, those don't make it on Instagram. I've seen a couple of well-known athletes accidentally females post like a nip slip, so you got to be careful. I've I've never had a nip slip problem. They take them down quickly, but I've I've screenshot them, so I got them saved. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure Roz is thrilled about that. She she's she you know she knows she knows what she's dealing with. So you and I, I was on your podcast. People should definitely check out not just that episode, but all the great stuff you put out there on the Active Life podcast. But you and I dove into so many topics, but one that hit home was, you know, this idea of what CrossFit's doing right, what CrossFit's doing wrong. And, uh, you know, definitely open to chatting more about that with you. But my question to you is, what are you excited about today? What would make you excited to talk that, that today? That is such a good question. <laughs> That's such a good question. You know, I thought of it. I thought long and hard what I wanted to ask you, and that was it. <laughs> so I, I'm really, really, really fired up to create value around the coach. And, and be, because I believe that right now, coaches are getting the short end of a stick, and that is leading to gyms being less successful than they could be and to members in those gyms getting less than they should be getting. And it all stems from the coach being minimized. Okay. So knowing you, this is your response. What's the solution, right? I forget your exact quote, but you usually say something of, you know, what problem are you solving? So there's the problem. How are you solving it? By professionalizing the coach. Turn pro. Hashtag turn pro. Hashtag turn pro. I mean, but, but, but that's for everybody. That's, if, if you want to get out of back pain, you got to turn pro about it. You got to be active. You got you to be all about it. Like if this is the only thing in the world, you're going to get it solved. But if you treat it like an amateur, you're going to keep your back pain. So give me the 30 second pitch of turn pro, right? If I used a snippet of, of you talking, how would you sell that? You know, but we see that a lot and it could take lot, lots of meanings, but how would you define turn pro? I would define term pro as the attitude to do whatever it takes to get it done, whatever it is. So there are too many people out there right now who are playing the victim card that I can't because of my, my race, because of my gender, because of my intelligence, because of my surroundings, because of where I grew up, because of my friends. All of these things are things that make it more difficult to be successful in any walk of life if they are the wrong card in the deck. But if there's anybody in the world who drew cards the same or worse than yours, who found a way to be successful, well, then you owe it to yourself to throw your cards in the fucking steam pile and move on. Hashtag turn pro. That's it. Turn pro. So if you, if you had no other options, what would you do? You have to turn pro about it and solve your own problems. I like that. I like that. Cause I do see that. And you know, I look at it as like, turn professional at your, but I like how that could really be anything, like be a mm -hmm. professional there. So let's go back to this. Coaches are getting the short end of the stick. How do we start to solve that? They turn pro, but what does that mean? I, I try to make this podcast for the CrossFit coach. What does that mean to them? What can they do? Yeah, so, it, well, well, I want to make it clear before I even go into this. The, the cascade effect of the coach getting the short end of the stick is the member getting the short end of the stick? Is the gym that employs the coach getting the short end of the stick? Because when you, when you put a ceiling on the potential of your staff, you put a ceiling on the potential of your business. And when you put a ceiling on the potential of your business, you put a ceiling on the potential of the people who patronize it. So when you say put a ceiling, are you referring to just the member rates, the, 
the all options of they have, all of it. So, so member rates, the problems that they can get solved in your facility. The, so for example, the idea that no one would ever pay for that is almost always the number one objection to adding anything new to a CrossFit gym. No one would ever pay for that. Well, maybe not. Definitely not with that attitude, but maybe not in general. You need to try it though to find out. And if they wouldn't pay for it, then there's two things that you're looking at. You either don't have a product market fit or you haven't figured out how to add enough value to be able to sell it. Do you, have any, do you have any examples of that? You know, no one ever paid for that. You know, 100%. That. Or so what, what are some you think of? Yeah, well, our mm -hmm. stuff, our stuff. So we, we teach coaches in CrossFit gyms across the world. CrossFit gyms, Globo gyms, it doesn't matter. You name it, we teach them. We teach doctors too how to help their clients get out of pain without going to the doctor and missing the gym. And we explain to them, if you're gonna do this, you shouldn't be doing it part-time. In fact, we make you talk to somebody on the phone first to make sure you're not a part-timer who's gonna do this on the side, that this is now going to be your thing. And when we're talking to them on the phone, we, we force the conversation of, how would you feel about charging somebody 250 to $300 a month to write them program design that's going to take 15 to 20 minutes a day, three to four days a week, and potentially 80 to $150 an hour for a training session, depending on where you live. And well, if they say me, no, what's that? I would say one of the benefits I love about your program is that it does only take 15 to 20 minutes a day. Yeah, well, that's the beauty of it. But so we've had coaches who have worked with us in the past who've been like, I'm just concerned that my members would never buy this from me, you know, from, from them once they finish the course. And I explained to them that's, that's a legitimate concern. Where do you think the problem is? Value or your salesmanship? And then it's just discussing the real reason somebody wouldn't buy it is not that it's too expensive, it's that they don't value it. Because if you think about it, right, if, if, if you told somebody, look, it's gonna cost you $5,000, and that person was like, Oh man, that's a lot. I can't afford $5,000 to get, to get out of pain without going to the doctor and missing the gym. Okay. I believe you forget about getting out of pain without going to the doctor, and missing the gym. I just bought your dream house in your dream town. And it's going to cost you $5,000 to buy it from me. Cause I'm a nice guy, but you have to come up with that $5,000 tonight and you're never allowed to sell the house. Can you find the $5,000 by tonight? And they're all going to say yes. You bet your fucking ass they can. So <laughs> it has nothing to do with, with the price. It has everything to do with the perceived value of the solution that you're providing. So we've had people who've come to us and I've been like, look, I understand that this is expensive for you because we charge 2,500 for the course or, or what is it? 2,750 if you make it in payments. And people, I don't have that. I, I physically don't have $2,500. And I tell them that's all the reason why you need to do this because in the last 10 years, you haven't figured out how to get to a place where you can afford $2,500 for a solution to a big problem that you have. Take out a loan. And they do. And they make their money back before the course is over, selling the solutions to people in their gyms who they never thought would buy from them. Yeah, I mean, one thing you and I have spoken about offline is just, you know, coaches need coaches. And mm -hmm. if you spend that money, you will make it back. If you do what you're told to do. You know, we... We have the good fortune of having worked with coaches who work with Chris Cooper, with Mad Lab, with Stu Brower, with you name it. And the ones who are successful before they come to us are the ones who just said, okay, and did what their coach told them to do. The ones who come to us failing and, and looking for like the magic bullet are the ones who did some of what their coach told them to do. You know, and if you're listening and you're a coach, what you need to think about are the people that ask you how to get fitter and you tell them it's running or rowing or this movement and that movement and they don't do it and how frustrated you are by that. That's what you're doing when you don't listen to your coach. Well, and, and, and I would add to that. If you told a member of your gym running or rowing or whatever it is, is the solution and they don't do it, then they either don't trust you, don't understand you, or don't really want the thing that they asked you for. So do you have a specific number? I don't know how detailed this is, but of coaches that have done this and the rate of return or what they've gotten back, like it doesn't have to be. You know, to yeah. The so, set, so, so we have a money back guarantee. You'll make all of the money that the course costs before the course is over. 
or we'll give you your money back. So it's someone in, someone invests twenty five hundred dollars. If they don't make that back, you literally will write them a check, assuming they're doing what you tell them to do. Yep, I will write you a check for twenty five hundred dollars because you you shouldn't have been in the course, and we should have caught that on the front end because it works. It's it's it is potent. It works if you do the work that we ask you to do. This is how good you are. We weren't even meant to talk about active life yet. And you've just <laughs> sold every listener on it because it's a money back guarantee. Why wouldn't you do it? Put it on a credit card. You're going to be able to pay it off based on what Sean is saying. Well, and, and we, we have people. So I'll give you an example. And I, I really hope that this isn't offensive to your listeners because I didn't mean to turn this into a commercial. But no, no, no. Because... No, I wouldn't have you on if I didn't believe in active life. So I do want people not to think Jay's just promoting this guy. I do your shit. I reached out to you a year ago to fix me. It's worked. I work with one of your coaches, uh, Nicole. Uh, she you know, tells me, she gives me some things to do. I listen about half the time <laughs> and I get half the results, right? Uh -huh. But I'm 41. I'll be 41 and I feel great. So if you're listening, don't just take his word, take my word, but go on. I appreciate that. Um, we had a guy who reached out to me who was like, look, he, this guy came to a workshop and didn't do what we told him to do when he left. Fine. Lives in Kansas. I, I want to say Topeka. And his business was on the fritz. Like he was on his way out of business. Has never had a $10,000 a month in his gym. Continues to have all of these things happen to him. And I say that with quotes around yes, him. Yes, of course. And I got on the phone with him in front of two people on my staff who I was training to sell. And I explained to him, these things are not happening to you. These things are happening because of you. And until you change who you are, what you offer, and how you offer it, and how you communicate the offer, they're going to keep happening to you. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to buy the immersion course for $2,500 now. And he was like, I can't afford that. You don't understand. I have credit cards that are maxed out. My relationship with my wife is actually pretty tumultuous right now because I've put us in such debt trying to chase down this dream and I can't make a living doing it. And, you know, I, I don't have that. I can't do it. And I said, cool. And I gave him the house analogy. I said, then find it. And I'm going to call you back in an hour. And if you don't answer in an hour, you're asking me questions, privileges have been revoked because he asks me questions all the time and I'm always answering them. You're like in a, you're like a mobster kind of. Well, it's like, look, you Have want my money. You, yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, so, so an hour later he signed up, he found it. He signed up. He sent me a message and I don't have my phone near me right now to read it to you because it would, you know, the static would, would come in and all that feedback. But, um, he wrote me a message saying like, Dr. Sean, I just have to thank you so much. Um, taking the immersion course is the best thing I ever did for myself, for my business, my relationship, my wife is better. We just had our, ten, our first $10,000 a month ever. The business is saved and I'm actually hiring staff now. And it, it was like, we, it's not even a gym management system. It's just how to solve bigger problems for people that they're dying for somebody to solve. Yeah, and it's not just the money they're bringing in with that programming, but it's the fact that you're keeping your members healthier so they're not going to quit. They're yeah, not going to leave. And you're attracting the person who wants that service that they can't get from their own gym. And for the record, you feel this way just about any coach. I've asked you about coaches and you're like, you will make this money back if you invest it because that's what happens when you invest in yourself. If you invest in something that is meant to have an ROI. Correct. Yes. Otherwise it can be more difficult to track. For example, I went to a mastermind with one of my mentors, Jesse Itzler back in November. It cost me $10,000 to go for the weekend, plus the travel and all that kind of stuff. I haven't seen a $10,000 financial return from it, but that wasn't the point. You know, it's ultimately, do I anticipate having that return? Maybe, but that course enabled me to grow as an individual. So there wasn't yeah, I'm going to get $10,000 out of this. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I, I think we would, you know, this conversation can go on about that, but long-term, the ROI will be there, be it financial or just on personal development. Well, it should be. I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm giving people the caution that it's not, you don't just throw money at things and then expect those things to solve themselves. Right. Like 
This isn't hire, the secret. Exactly. You hire something that hire someone or buy something that you believe is the next logical step between you and the goal that you want. And then execute the ever living shit out of that thing until you've exhausted it. Go back to the person who gave it to you and ask them if they have anything else and then move on to something else because you're making the money that you couldn't make before and you're ready for something new. So you're saying the problem is stemming from the top. Box owners aren't creating this. So coaches, you know, before we got on, you're like, coaches can't afford a tuna fish sandwich. Mm -hmm. The problem is their box owners aren't creating that value at their box. So the coaches can't then turn around and offer training. Yeah. There's a, there, so here's the thing. It's, I said this on an Instagram live today. I've never seen another fitness methodology solve as many problems for as many people in a group as CrossFit has. I have never seen it. And that's why I opened a CrossFit gym because I believe in pure CrossFit, the way it is meant to be done as in my opinion, the most effective fitness methodology for the masses. That said, almost everybody in every single CrossFit gym has something that they would love to have improved at an accelerated pace that the group cannot offer. But as affiliate owners, we have, and I was one of them, we have pushed onto people that this method provides individualized results in a group setting for a group price. And that's not true. That is a lie. And when we do that, what happens is we devalue the one-on-one -on -one session because they're supposed to get it in group now. Aren't I supposed to get my first pull-up in group class? Sure, if you have a 12-year background of, of, of high school and collegiate athletics and even little league and you used to do pull-ups on the playground and you lost them over the last five years, yeah, you're going to get your pull-up in class. If you never had a pull-up in your life, you need to lose 50 pounds and you were sedentary prior, very unlikely. Now, when you, when you pile onto that, what ends up happening is it downward spirals into something where a, a CrossFit coach, this, this is offensive to me, a CrossFit coach is paid a few dollars more than a high school student flipping burgers at McDonald's. It's fucking disgusting. And we expect those people to elicit great results for a complex set of issues that people have when they walk into a gym and want solved. I'm going to get that from someone paying, being paid 15 to $20 an hour. They're going to be the person. And it's nothing against that person. It's that that person cannot possibly afford the time, the travel, the connections, the energy to continue to improve their education because they don't have any money. Okay. You've said a lot there, Sean. So let me, let me take a stab at responding. You yeah. know, I, having been someone that's seen a lot of people get their first pull-ups in class, what, what, what do you think that is? And maybe that's not necessarily the greatest example out there. No, but, but, but it's a good example because it yeah. works. Right. CrossFit works. People are getting pull-ups, but are you saying unless they work one-on-one, -on -one, they won't achieve that? No. What I'm saying, great question. I'm glad you asked it. Some people <laughs> will get their, most people can probably get their pull-ups in the class. Okay. But there might be 15 to 20% of people who never will. And they're going to think everybody else is, so it's my fault. I must not be doing something right. Now, of the 80% who did get a pull-up, maybe 20% of them have shoulder pain. And they just think they have to live with it for the rest of their life. The group class is not solving that. And maybe another 20% of them couldn't pop possibly on a mile in under six minutes. The group class isn't going to solve that for them. They need a more specific program for that. Maybe some of them still live with a little bit of that belly fat, despite the fact that they can do all of these things and they have the subconscious um, negative self-talk that they have this belly fat. And because they're not getting direct nutrition coaching inside of that gym, they feel less than. That's what I'm saying. Everybody in that gym has a specific problem set that the gym is not solving as a group. If that wasn't true, 
own your eating wouldn't exist. Active life wouldn't exist. No, that makes sense. And let me paraphrase, summarize. CrossFit in general will get people fitter. Yes. It's not going to solve everyone's personal issue without some specific coaching, be it I want to get stronger, I want to improve my endurance, I want to drop the last five pounds. You're right. We need some uh, individual attention, if that's important to you. Plenty of people are just, with the exception of that pain that you mentioned, plenty of people, like for me, I'll never, I say this because I don't want to put the effort in, but I'll never run a sub 630 mile. It's not a priority for you. It's not a priority, but you're right. If I wanted to achieve that, I would need to focus on that and maybe hire someone that's better at coaching that than someone at the box, even though it might actually decrease my overall fitness because maybe I would lose strength or lose my ability to perform that 12 to 15 minute zone. Yeah, but, but I mean, look, I just started taking mixed martial arts back in December. I can't wait to tap you out, yep. You would tap me out in a second, okay? I, I'm not very good at it yet. And I didn't join a group class so that some schmuck like you could just tap me out all the time for fun. I walked in and I said to the instructor, how long do I need and how often do I need to be a reasonably defensible person where I, I'm not going to just be the punching bag and, and the, the tap out machine in the gym? He's like, I think that we need to work together for six months one-on-one so you can walk into class and feel like you're competent. I was like, great, what's that gonna cost? And I paid it because for me, the problem was I don't want the slow curve. I want, I want to shrink time. I understand that that's not cost effective for everybody. Fine. But if you're dealing with negative self-talk around the way that your belly looks or the muffin top over the, pack, the top of your pants and the gym isn't solving the issue, it's only going to spiral into worse and worse and worse and worse and worse self-talk because you think you're doing what you need to do and you're not getting the results that you want. So you're suggesting that the, the problem is coaches need to be earning more because in order, if, if we want them to be able to offer those solutions by learning more, um, by getting out there and learning from others, immersing themselves in these courses, they need to be paid more. Yeah, now, because otherwise there's no incentive to do it. Right? If, if, you're, if you're in a gym and you're a coach and you're paid a set percentage, no matter how much you charge, Four ninths, say. Say four ninths. Okay. Well, then let's, let's just take, for example, a $70 training session because that's about average in CrossFit gyms across the country from what I've heard. That means you're making about $30. The gym is making about 40 I have no problem with that. Where I do have a problem is if you recognize that I can't make a living and go on vacation ever, buy a house ever, not live paycheck to paycheck ever take my wife out to dinner ever see my kids ever if you realize that you can't do those things at thirty dollars an hour and you're willing to walk into your boss's office and say look i can't afford to continue working here i have to get a second job and do this as a hobby or i have to leave but you're unwilling to do that walk into your boss's office instead and say hey i recognize you need to clear $40 a training session. I'd like to charge 100 so I can clear 60. I will be responsible for marketing and selling those sessions. If the gym owner was already happy at one point making 40, it's only a dick measuring contest if that number needs to go up. Okay, so you, you are putting some of the onus on these trainers, right? All it's not it. just, okay, all of it. Now, this is probably taking us down another road, but I would say maybe you might know this answer better than I do. What percentage of CrossFit coaches these days do you think do it full time? You know what? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't catch all that question. Say that again. I said, what percentage of CrossFit coaches do you think do this full time? Almost none. And that's a huge problem. Okay. So you, okay. So we're on the same page. Cause my opinion would be, a lot of the coaches out there, you know, do this for two to six hours a week in addition to their full-time job. Right. Which- and, 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 and that's the point. Do you want the fucking cardiologist who sees patients for two to six hours a week to be your cardiologist when it's your turn? The guy who's 
doing road work because he's got to pay the bills. But, you know, everyone's, I love cardiology. So I'll listen to your heart murmur and let you know what I think. Uh, I mean, I don't do it all the time. I don't, oh, have you read the research? Dude, I don't really have time for that. I mean, I'm, you know, I love this. I'm really passionate about it. I watch some YouTube videos, but I mean, I got to, I'm a construction worker. I got to make my living, right? Yeah, don't be my doctor, please. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. So you're, you're suggesting that by doing these things that you're talking about, raising rates, learning more, you're going to be able to quit your, you know, quote unquote, real job and do this job that you're actually passionate about full time. If that is what you desire, I'm not recommending that today you quit your job and you start doing this full time. What I'm recommending is that you put on paper a plan to quit your job and do this full time, that you set a, a kill rate. Essentially, I'm making an agreement with myself that once I make this much money doing this thing that I love, I will quit the other thing that I don't love so that I can make more money doing this other thing. And then go all in, turn pro on it. That's what I'm suggesting. And, and one of my favorite quotes is from a guy named Ed Milet. It's if you want to build confidence, make promises to yourself and keep them. So if you set that date, own it. I, I love it because one of the big things I hear is basically the opposite of what we're saying. And I, and I firmly agree with you. I preach, I'm a little more like, hey, quit your job today type of person. Um, I, you know, I, I had, did. Yeah, and, and, and so did I when I opened my you know, first affiliate. Granted, I was a trainer, so I was in this world. But yeah, I, and I've seen it. I had a coach that worked for me and he had a really well-paying job at GE, six figures. He quit it and opened an affiliate, you know, and, and granted you're not, you know, we're saying just a coach, but I hope that people are listening, took notes and that's probably going to be the snippet that I play out there. So people can hear you talk about it because there's nothing more rewarding than doing what you love for a living. Well, I'll give you a snippet right now. Uh Oh, if, if you, I mean, if you are somebody who's passionate about, providing fitness to other people for a living, then you're doing yourself and those other people a disservice by doing it passionately part-time because you will never be as good as a part-time coach with another job as you would be as a full-time coach with a single focus. That's the truth. That, that is the truth. It's scary though, right? So people are listening to this and they're like, great, Sean, you do this for a living. Jay, you've done it. You got involved back in the day. It was easier. I can't do it. What do you say? No, you're right. You can't. Yeah, I was about to say, I know what you're going to say. Because, because th- that, that's the mindset that you're never going to get there. The question, like, one of my favorite things to tell people is the bigger the problem, the greater the resolution. So if your fear is around leaving your fears i could never do that great figure out how you could and then execute on that like it's most people stop at i could never or that's scary i don't know and that's just the end of it without saying okay let me take a deep breath and let me see if i really 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 wanted to what would i have to be able to do what education would i need to do that Where would I need to do that? Maybe if you live in Oklahoma and people's average household income is $30,000 a year, and I don't know anything about Oklahoma, okay? So I don't know why I chose that state. But if that's the rate, maybe that's the wrong place for you to do it. But at the same time, I've had clients who live in towns like Greenwood, South Carolina, where the average household income is $27,000, and they're selling $3,000 training packages left and right. We have a lot of Oklahoma listeners, so I hope you didn't offend them. I've, but, I've been to Oklahoma. I don't just fly <laughs> over it. I've been there. No, I actually like Oklahoma. My good friends own twice bitten CrossFit out there. So big fan of Oklahoma. But again, I, th- I think what you said well. Wait, is which gym? Which gym? Twice bitten CrossFit. What's that person's name? Uh, Rob and Trammy. Okay, no. Someone asked me a question on my Instagram from Tulsa, Oklahoma today. And I was like, I would love to talk to you about this on Zoom and then we'll, we'll, we'll post it. What so was the it, question? So we could check it out. It was a, like a, a multi-part question, which is why I didn't just answer it. It was, 
you know, I started my gym with $250,000 out of, you know, money that I saved and, and pulled out of my retirement and I bought my equipment and my equipment depreciates in value. And at what point is the coach making too much of the profit on a session as compared to what I need to make on the session? And what I wanted to answer would have come across as callous and abrupt because it would have been, you need to make whatever you need to make. And then the coach can charge whatever they want on top of that. But that, but that wouldn't have come across well in written form. And I know that there would be follow-up questions to it, so I want to do it with them on a Zoom call. Well, I definitely want to check that out, but I'm glad you answered it in case people were listening. I think that's, you know, that's different. I had Chris Cooper on um, previously, and you're basically going against his model. I'd love to have you two on for a debate. But, and, and again, you and I talked b- before this. You're a fan of Cooper. You send people to Cooper. You're just suggesting that maybe the four ninths model now is outdated. I th- no, I would go further than that. It never worked. What I what I what I would say though is, I don't know one twentieth of what Chris Cooper knows as far as back end systems and you know all the stuff that a gym needs to run. Like how many barbells do you have versus how many members? How many dollars per square foot? I could figure that stuff out but I haven't immersed myself in it. I haven't solved the problems of hundreds or thousands. Never mind. I'll leave where I was going to go with that off the table, but I haven't solved the problems for CrossFit gym owners as much as he has. So I wouldn't pretend to be as good of a coach to a CrossFit gym owner who just wants a system for his or her gym as Chris Cooper is. That said, I will dance circles around Chris Cooper's model to build personal training in a CrossFit gym. It doesn't work. And that's, that's where he and I disagree. And, and hey, Cooper's a, you know, an adult. He's open-minded. I'm sure you guys can have a healthy chat about it, right? And I don't know the answer these days. I've done it without the four-ninths model. I've done it with the four-ninths model. I've seen people have great success with it. I do. I that under- great, wait, wait, hold on. Great success with it being the gym owner or the coach? I, I suppose when I say great success, I just mean I see people doing personal training. I don't know who's being successful with it. I I do think the CrossFit world, because of what you said earlier, can be a challenge to grow a one-on-one program. The whole sale of CrossFit is, hey, you're going to get that one-on-one feel, but for a group training rate. But And that needs to change. Because then we do tell coaches, I've heard this before, box owners with coaches, like you're saying, they're like, well, go get one-on-one clients. But it's hard for them because the box owners aren't pushing it. And I believe, like you said, it's because they don't see the value. So it's not something they feel confident promoting. it's, it's, It's because they believe that they are so great. And yet all of these people have all of these problems. And I gotta be honest, it comes from the top down. I've heard Glassman shit on movement assessments on on the CrossFit podcast. And he's wrong. He called Greg Cook a charlatan. I don't love Greg Cook, but Glassman's a charlatan when you talk that way. And I think Glassman's great, but when, but you can't, you can't do that because now you devalue any kind of continuing education that your coaches want to get. Yeah. I mean, I heard that episode. I think when coach Glassman was saying that he was also saying, Hey, you're doing an assessment by watching someone squat, by watching them move. And I honestly don't know enough about the FMA or what Greg Cook does, but you know, what about, I think part of the issue is Susie at the gym wants kipping pull-ups mm-hmm. and a coach, because they're so passionate about it, will say, Hey, let me work with you for a few minutes for free. Yeah. That's what did you say? That's part of this problem as well. Huge. But that's because it's community and, and, and you're supposed to do things for free in a community. That's bullshit. And, and I would like to go back one quick second. You cannot assess somebody by watching them do a squat. I can give you a litany of it. We had a guy on our staff who did a watt clean pistol thruster with 205 pounds. Moved beautifully. When you watched it, I watched him overhead pistol 185. Beautiful. No ankle range of motion, excruciating knee pain and low back pain. His squat was beautiful. If you watch it, you'd be like, nothing to fix here. So you, you can't look at a, at a movement that's coordinated and assume that you have any clue what's going on at the joint level. You have to look 
at the joint first. But now going back to what you had just described, when you help somebody outside of class, you think you're doing the right thing. You think you're being the nice person. You're doing it out of the goodness of your heart. The problem is the people who you're doing it for don't get any follow through on it. There's no curriculum to follow. There's no progression. There's no volume reduction when they're doing too much. So they end up just doing what you told them to do over and over and over again and not getting the results. And you become frustrated that they didn't get the results when you told them what to do. And the reason is you never charged them and you never built a formal curriculum to solve the problem. So let's role play because I think you're really good at this. I'm Susie, right? Hi, Susie. Yeah. Now, hey, we just did a workout with, with pull-ups that I had to scale. You know, we're not going to dive into scaling, but I did ring rows and, you know, simply because I don't have the strength to do pull-ups. And, and I come over to you after class and say, oh, man, I'm really frustrated that, you know, so-and-so and these people are getting pull-ups and I just can't get them. Can you show me something to do to get better at pull-ups? Got it. So, Susie, if I understand you correctly, you're a little bit frustrated that you don't have pull-ups yet. Is that right? I'm very frustrated, Sean. Okay. Do you mind if I ask why you're frustrated by that? Because I've seen you come a really long way. Why, why, are, why is this one movement so frustrating for you? Well, you know, it was my goal when I walked in. I saw other people doing them, and I always thought it'd be cool to do that. You know, I turned 41 in June, and I'd like to be able to do pull-ups at 41, and, and all my friends are doing them. Okay. I, I mean, I think that those are, those are fair reasons. And I want to be straightforward with you. Do, you. do you mind if I'm really honest with you, Susie? No, I'd like that. Okay. I believe that if I gave you some quick pointers on how to do pull-ups, that by the way, you could find on YouTube or Google or anywhere for free, that I would set you up on a path to continue thinking that you knew what you needed to know to get your pull-ups and in six months or a year from now, you would still be very frustrated. I don't want that for you. What I would like to do is set you up for an assessment so that we can figure out why you don't currently have pull-ups. Because the answer is probably not just more pull-ups or a little technique change. Why don't we set up an assessment to figure out why you don't have pull-ups yet? And then after the assessment, we can discuss what the best plan to get you your pull-ups is. Does that sound fair? That sounds wonderful. That's how you do it. And I'm very attracted to you, Coach Sean, by the way. I'd like for you to know that before we move on <laughs> to our program. I'm married and I have three kids. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I mean, you, you know, it's, it's a great sales technique. It's, it's, it's cool. And I do think you're right. I mean, I've been guilty of it as a coach. I've, I can coach the shit out of a kipping pull-up. I understand it very well. But you're right. Oftentimes it becomes like, let me look at it. Let me give you some pointers. Here's some volume progression, you know, do one on the minute for 10 minutes and you know, that type of stuff when you're right. Is that value? Sure. Am I going to get Susie pull-ups in a timely fashion safely? Not as much as if I worked one-on-one -on -one with her. Well, and, and, and the counter argument to that, the, 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 the continuation I should say is how does Susie feel now in six months with coach Jason giving her advice every day after class and she still doesn't have it. Yeah. I seem like a shitty coach. And she feels worse about herself because she know you think you feel like a shitty coach. She feels like you're a great coach because she's seen you get it for everybody else and she still can't do it. So it must right. be her. That's a, that's a good, that's a great point. Now, you know, as, as people listening know, like some of that could be, she needs to lose weight like you suggested, mm -hmm. but I'm sure a lot of that happens within these coaching opportunities now where you can sit down and discuss nutrition. You can sit down and discuss other things because you have this time with her. Yes. And, and, and well, and chances are she's going to work harder because she's invested. hundred percent. And, and you have an accountability plan. It's not like, Oh, Susie missed pull up day the last three, three weeks in a row. So she's not getting any practice. I, I, I love it. I think if you're listening, that's just solid advice. You, you know, it's not, sales and selling isn't why we get into this, but you can only get into this if you're paying the bills. Well, it's, it's like Glassman says, jetliners don't exist to burn gas, but they need gas to exist or fuel. He says fuel. But so the point is for coaches and CrossFit gyms, I think it's so difficult 
for them to wrap their mind around how important something like a pull-up is to somebody. Because for most coaches in a CrossFit gym, let's face it, they've always been able to do pull-ups. So it becomes this nonchalant like, hey, yeah, I can show you how to do this on the side. It's no big deal. To that person, getting a pull-up is like the pinnacle of their life. It goes back to elementary school when they were the fat kid hanging on the bar and they couldn't do it. And all of their friends who were in gymnastics were banging out pull-ups. It goes back to when they were on the playground and they couldn't climb on the monkey bars. It goes back to when they were in middle school and they got cut from all the sports teams. It's a sense of accomplishment that somebody who never had to accomplish something like that can write off without recognizing the importance of it. And I always tell those people, these coaches, think about it like something that you have put on the wall as a big goal for yourself. Give me an example. I want to buy a house. I want to have a kid. I want to whatever. Cool. This is their that. Treat it that way. If you said to me, hey, I want to make it to the CrossFit Games. Do you have any advice? And I was like, yeah, dude, do like two a days, three days a week and make sure you're working in uh, endurance, metabolic conditioning, gymnastics, and strength training. And, uh, ample rest and, you know, get your diet under control and you should be good. That's really all the advice you need. But is it going to get into the CrossFit games? Absolutely not. And it's not getting Susie a pull-up either. No, I, I think that's a great way to kind of reframe all of this. You know, every weekend at the level one, someone will get their muscle up for the, you know, their very first strict muscle up. I hear from people seven years later that I helped get their first strict muscle up at their level one. I hear, I got a text the other day from an 80 year, old, 80 year old, I think she's in Kenya, who was like, thank you so much for helping with my squat and came in handy here, you that's know? Awesome. And it was like, yeah, I, I think that's a great way to put it. I think, I, and having been around for so long, I know I've been very guilty of this mindset and it's something, you know, that Chris Cooper does talk about, he's like, you are not your demographic. So if you're handicapping them by your, you know, paychecks, you're not going to make enough money. Your demographic has more money than you. You're also not your staff who likely doesn't have as much money as you. Right. So you need to, you're, you're also giving advice to the box owner and making sure they understand. And the truth is, yeah, the best gyms in 10 years will be the ones that have a full-time staff making six figures. If you're content with your box, having all part-time coaches working two or four hours, they may be super passionate, but they're not going to become the best coaches out there. Exactly. And, and I want to also provide full transparency. I owned multiple CrossFit gyms and didn't do the best job owning them. I was not the best CrossFit gym owner. I saw what it took to be successful. I understood what was required of me and chose not to do it. I, I wasn't great at it. It's that, that's the reality. So I, I get people all the time who will be like, well, you're giving these gym owners advice and your gym was fine, but like you didn't crush it. I'm like, no, but it's not for lack of knowledge. It's for lack of execution and, and lack of desire to crush it. And, you know, and in, in fairness, these, you know, five, seven years later, you're now implementing what you've learned with active life. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. And, and, and I always tell people this too. I, I'm not paying you for the hour. I'm paying you for the life that led to the hour. So yeah. it, it doesn't matter how long you're doing it for. Like none of that matters. It's, it's what do you know and how can you execute it? You know, most of these episodes are all about how to improve as a coach, tangible things, you know, be the best version of you, have a good timeline, et cetera. We're really, this can go a step deeper. And it's like, you can only do that if you're giving yourself that opportunity. Yeah, you can't, you can't be, you can't be a great coach if you can't afford to be a great coach, plain and simple. And there, there's a, there might be a six month, a year long, even two years where you grind. Yeah. You know, you don't just walk into being a coach and get paid 50, 60, $70 an hour. It's not how it works. So you might have to walk in and grind it. As long as you're on the path to being where you want to go, you can afford to grind it because you know that this is not the lifestyle that you're looking to sustain for the next 20, 30 years. It's a one to two year thing so that you can have a different life. 
It's like Gary V talks about. I'm sure you're familiar with them. It's like you got to eat shit for a couple of years. I ate shit for like 12. Yeah, there's some times, right? We're still doing it. But, you know, when it's eating shit kind of is different, right? Now it's going to be getting tapped out versus not having the money to do it. But there's all different definitions of that, you know, proverbial eating shit. Sure. Well, I mean, if you look at Active Life as a company, I mean, we stagnate. You know, we hit plateaus and they frustrate the hell out of me because I want everybody in the world who we can help to get our help. And I want my staff to be paid the way that my staff needs to be paid. And I need clients to pay my staff. So when we stagnate, I still feel like I'm eating shit. I go back to the drawing board and do what they're doing to find the problems, to fix them. Well, let's bring it there then. If people want to learn how they can learn from you, improve their movement, get out of pain, what are some of the options? Where can they find you? They can find us on Active Life RX on Instagram is the easiest place to find us. And I can answer all of their questions from there. And you are good at that. You are on it. And you also, like we talked about earlier, post pictures from the toilet, which is important. I don't think I posted that on Active Life. I think I posted that on my personal page. Well, they should follow your personal page as well. What's that? Dr. Sean Pastuch. Thanks. D-R, Sean Pastuch. S-E-A-N-P-A-S-T-U-C. No, you, you know, you put some great stuff out there. I'll put both of those in the, in the show notes in case you can hear us or understand it. But you put some great stuff out there. I see your stuff on, on Facebook as well. You're motivating. And the reason you're motivating to me, we don't agree on everything 100%, but you're open-minded. and you've been through it. So I always like to trust people that you're not blowing smoke there. There are too many people out there in social media world talking about this and that, that don't do it. You're one mm -hmm. of the guys that are doing it. Yeah. And, and I would hate to agree with you on everything. Cause then what would we talk about? How much, how much we agree with each other? That would be yeah, more. I mean, that'd be fun. We would snuggle, talk about things we like. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me ask you a couple at least this other question when i always ask all my all my guests what's sure. one book that you highly recommend the listeners check out well it's not published yet but i can do anything by dr sean pastuch is going to be out anytime now um so that's a good book when does that come out, out? I, you know i was uh, that's funny because my follow-up to whatever you were going to say was going to be when are you going to write a book? So um, I had no idea. So it, it's called I Can Do Anything. And then the subtitle is um, How to Chase Big Dreams, Impact Other People in a Positive Way, and something else that's changed so many times without asking the world for permission. I was going to say, that's a long title, especially if you don't remember, but I'll go with I Can Do Anything. I, will I Can Do Anything is, is the title. When, when um, do you anticipate that being available on Amazon? I, I don't know. I actually just got um, a literary agent and I'm in the process of going through writing a new proposal for the book so she can pitch it to publishing houses. Are you trying to get it legit published, not self-published like me? Yeah, I have nothing against self-publishing, but I, I want to, I wanna, as soon as it's out there, I want to write the next one. Very cool. Well, we'll definitely check that out. But in the meantime, yeah. any other book you'd recommend? So, to a CrossFit coach, is that who our audience is? Primarily, but it could be, you know, anything, a book that hit home with you. So I, be I personally believe that sales is an incredibly important part of anything that anybody does down to me selling my wife to have sex with me from time to time. How often is that really? You're not that great at selling that. I mean, at least I'm three. Probably, at least three times <laughs> since you're married. Yeah. Um, I mean, more than monthly. Uh, nice. <laughs> uh, so less than daily. More than monthly, probably around weekly. All right. Hey, I think that's a solid, solid accomplishment. Yeah. So The Way of the Wolf is a good book for people to read by Jordan Belfort because it, it takes sales from a convincing conversation to an understanding and educating conversation. And for um, those unfamiliar with him, that's The Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. So I don't, I don't re recommend doing quaaludes, blowing coke and ripping people off but the way he teaches sales takes it from being this this esoteric thing that is like i have to remember all of this stuff down to very very simple oh okay that's where my mind should be while sales is occurring um that's a great book to read i strongly recommend crossfit gym owners 
read a book called Blue Ocean Strategy. And the reason I recommend that book is because if I ask CrossFit gym owners across the country, what makes you different than the CrossFit gym down the block? They almost always tell me better coaching, better programming, better community, which is the same thing the gym down the block just told me about them. And Blue Ocean Strategy is a very cool book about finding something that you do differently than everybody else and marketing the hell out of that. And that's, I read that book and then started Active Life. I like that. And we don't have time to dive into that maybe on the next one, but that is something you always tell people to figure out like what separates you. And I think one thing, you know, if you don't know this about Sean is you're not afraid to send people to your competition. No, I send people away all the time. Yeah. You have to be willing to do that. And either because you truly don't know the answers or because you know, they're going to come back. Or because they're just not a fit. I have people who come to us all the time who are like, Hey, I want to learn how to do uh, you know, exercise, exercise science development for clients. Basically they're like, I want to learn how to program for a client. I'm like, cool. You should go to OPEX. Like, we, we don't, we don't teach that. Oh, but what about your immersion course? It doesn't solve that problem. It solves a different problem. If you want to learn how to help keep people get out of pain without going to the doctor, and missing the gym, take the immersion course. If you want to get somebody a big clean and a six minute mile, take OPEX. Very cool. Very cool. Well, we could definitely be back on here talking in the future, especially when the book is out and ready to go so we can drive people to Amazon. I will be reading it. I appreciate your time, Dr. Sean. My pleasure, Dr. Jason. Any, anything else you'd like to push out there that we didn't cover? We got your Instagram. We got Active Life. Anything else? Yeah, I'd like people to know that everything about what's going on day to day is a choice. And that if you, if you decide that you didn't get into the fitness business to make money, then you're going to stay poor. You can coach people in fitness for free and go make a living doing something else. But if you want to make a living in the fitness business, then understand that you need to make a living in the fitness business. Well said. Well said. You got me fired up. I got goosebumps. I got goosebumps. When coaches start doing that, clients will start getting better results. And that's what it comes down to. That's how we're going to change this world that we live in. That's right. Well, thank you very much. I look forward to continuing this chat and I hope people check out Active Life RX because if you want to continue to do this thing and you want to stay pain-free, that's the place to go. Thanks, Jason.